Here we are again. Only now we're going to go to the time of Constantine. Because I want you to see how biting this wit is, this four-way wit. It's also biting in Ephesians 1, but I've already done the videos on Constantine there. So a link will be in the video description to the Vimeo videos on Constantine. So that you can compare those at your leisure with these four passages. And you'll see just how much they triangulate to say a very biting and nasty commentary on how bad Constantine is. Because Constantine is the first poster boy, down here, Revelation, he is the first poster boy of the Antichrist. Now, for centuries, especially uh, from the Calvinist and Reform groups, the Catholics have always been depicted as the religion of the Antichrist, okay, in Revelation. Because, yes, it is Rome. But what they forget is that there are two Romes. All right. And it's something of a slap in the face to the Calvinists and the teachers who kept on insisting that it was Italy Rome, that they didn't notice that there was this other Rome that was really much worse and actually fits the description in Revelation 17, which the first Rome doesn't exactly fit. So, this is going to be a little upsetting to those of you who are Calvinists or are Reformed or want to have it in for the Roman Catholic Church. Now, I'm not a fan, as you should know from my other videos. I am no fan of the Roman Catholic Church. But I'm also no fan of saying something that you can prove untrue. Okay? So, we're going to go through this. Because it's going to be really important. Remember, there are going to be people alive during the tribulation. They're going to need to know this stuff. Part of our role down here, besides growing spiritually for ourselves, is to leave a paper trail. And most of the paper trail left about the Re Revelation 17 beast is false. And as time gets closer and closer to the time when this is actually going to happen, it's going to be important to correct the paper trail. And in part, that's what I'm here for. I didn't know that when I first got into this. I hate prophecy. And I especially hated Revelation. My pastor made us sit through it for seven hours a week. Seven new classes. Seven new hours every single week for four freaking years. I hated it. 1981 to 1985. And so here I am because I hated it. But because the teaching was so thorough, I actually can understand what this is. Okay, I can read the Bible in the Greek as a result of all that teaching. Because it took me about 18 months before my pastor would keep on writing these words on the board. And I get sick of just watching him write it. I finally learned how to write it myself. Okay, so this is going to be important for correcting the timeline and correcting our understanding. And again, you be skeptical of what I say because I'm saying it. What you do is you go to God and you say, Okay, God, you know, how do I prove if this is true or false? And should I even spend any time on it? Okay? So that's where we start. So we're going to go to Constantine. And to help you understand to do that, especially in Matthew and to some extent in Luke and in Mark and especially in Revelation, I've made up a lot of little little marks. So if you wanted to go to Matthew 25 verse 37, there you go. You want to go to Matthew 24 33, there you go. Matthew 25 12, which is our time. Okay? And each of these keywords, which are called anaphora in the Greek, each of these keywords brackets off a type of history. Like apokrites is about judgment. Amen Lego Humin is about something really dramatic every single time it occurs. Because we've got a lot of past now, so we know how to interpret the present. Samayan, of course, means sign, and that has its own little drama. Every time the word Christos appears, or Jesus, or Parousia, or Curias, or Nymphias, those are all synonyms for Christ. 
Each has a slightly different emphasis. Nymphias is means bridegroom, so it emphasizes intimacy. That applies mostly to our time, from the War of the Austrian Succession, which was about who would husband the Holy Roman Empire. That's the first time the word is used for that year, that that happened. Okay? Or Kurias, Lord, that applies to our time. Who will Lord? Who will be your Lord? Will your Lord be politics and a fake Messiah? Or will your Lord be the real one? And that's exactly how these words are used every single time. Okay? As I've shown you in prior videos. So you should be kind of familiar with this by now. Barusia means appearing. To show up. Well, God shows up to you through his word. And Jesus, of course, is his first name. That's stressing his manhood. Christos stresses his anointed status as being Messiah. Okay, Basileus stresses his, you know, second coming. And that's the only place Basileus is used. Because Basileus means king. It's only used at the very end. Okay, so there's a progression of meaning and a progression of history being bracketed by these uh, um, anaphora and the time distance in other words the syllable counts between the first and the second apocrites here in verse 2 verse 4 then the next time here in Matthew 25 9 12 the distance of the syllable counts is divisible by seven each time same thing for um, well, Amen uses a trinity meter, so it's divisible by three each time. And once it's divisible by seven, right here in the middle. Okay. Blepo and Horao, meaning to see. Each occurrence is also between the first occurrence of a Blepo and the next occurrence of Blepo or Horao and the next one and the next one and the next one. These are all divisible by seven. The, the syllable counts are divisible by seven. <coughs> the same thing is true for Christos, Jesus, Parousia, Kurias. Every single occurrence of Kurias versus itself is divisible by seven. Then when it switches from Kurias to Nufias, the difference between the pr prior Kurias and Nufias, as I've shown you in previous videos, is also the, the syllable counts are divisible by seven. Are you getting the picture that we've really got the original words? These are deliberate structures, and they're always divisible by seven? In two whole chapters, it works like this. From Numphias to Basileus. From Numphias back to Curias. From Numphias to, from Curias to Numphias. Every single time, the distance, counting the syllables, is divisible by seven. So, like here is one of the phrases. Wait a minute, I don't think that's what I meant. All right, let's see. I might have done that one wrong. Let's go to 42. Okay, see here's Hokurias. You see how it's highlighted? All right, so then when you click on it, it takes you to the notes, because it's an anaphora, and it's telling you what the syllable count is. It's telling you that it's, the distance is seven, divisible by seven back to Parousia, which was the last, the last occurrence. This is the first occurrence of Kurias. So it, it, it doesn't measure back to another occurrence because it's the first one. But it's divisible by seven back to Parousia, which is a synonym. Okay, and then this is the time period it spans. And what, why did, why, why did God create it that way? And you have to say God did it. Because where do you get this kind of specificity? The the scribes were making the copies of this. They didn't know this precision existed. They were just trying to copy what they had. Okay? And so when you go back here, and you're like, Oh, this is referencing Wycliffe and Huss. So it's like the Lord is appearing to you through his teachers, through the guys who are the major, the, these are the, this was the real start of what we call the Reformation back in 1400s. Okay? And then the distance to the next one, which is right here. Okay? Here's the next one in verse 45. And it was sevening 
from the prior one there okay which we just saw and this is when it covers and that covers Wingley, Erasmus and Luther so you see the use of Curios as specific persons at specific years it's divisible by seven from the last usage into the next one because you see it's also used in verse 46 and 48 and see like here this is the 70 okay we'll see this 14 1485 was the last syllable that it sevens to well here's where it started at the other curios this time it stands for John Knox Calvin and the English Reformation holy Toledo okay it's specific you getting that I hope you're getting that. This is real specific about history. And this is how many times. There's like 50 entries here. There's no way a human being could have figured that out. And all the scribes didn't know this. The Catholic Church does not know what I'm telling you. This is how you prove divine writ. This is how God preserved his word. And nobody knows this. They used to know, obviously, because this design is in Scripture itself, so people knew how to read it. Okay? So, and people were wondering it. I did videos on that after the 40-second video to show you that everybody kind of suspected something was going on. That there was some kind of meter in the Bible, but they couldn't find it. Because they didn't count it right. Just like they don't do Bible dates right. So, now that you know where to find these verses, so now let's come down to Constantine, because that's what I want to focus on. Now remember, 250 plus 30 would be 280. All right, that's just when when our boy uh, Diocletian is just getting started. Okay, this is 291. So you add 30. Okay, he was formally emperor in 285. So we'll start about here. Okay, so in Matthew, that's going to be 261 equals 291. Okay, and now we got to do the same thing with Luke. We got to go to a parallel period. And the closest number to that is going to be 272. That's be 302. And you'll notice there's a big clause here. I could probably could have split it up, but I couldn't figure out how to split it up into a two clauses. I suppose I could make it a second clause here because that's epi. Alright. But that would be 283. So that's pretty close to 250. This is when um, Diocletian starts. 283. It's the same thing in Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1 in particular uses AD years so he's really easy to follow, Paul. But here we have to add 30. 283 is when Diocletian himself dated the start of his own reign. That is not his official start in the history books. That's when he dated it. Because we happen to have preserved Diocletian's own words about when he counted himself to start. And there's an old book on it. It was written in the 1800s called The Persecution of Diocletian. You should be able to Google on that and find it. I want to say the book was written in like 1876. Okay, it's in the, uh, in the Ephesians 1 write-up in the documents that I did for Ephesians 1 videos, it, it'll be there right in the section that belongs to Diocletian. You can just click on the link. But I don't remember the name now. So here we got 250 in Matthew, which stands for 280. Closest is 283, so you'll notice that Luke is matching the, the same meter in Paul as 283. So Luke is matching to Paul. Okay, specifically in Ephesians 1.10. E, that's where you'll find it. At 283. Okay, so Luke is matching Paul exactly. And he's coming close. And it's like, well, why is there a three-year difference with Matthew? Well, we're going to find that out. But I'm just showing you the methodology again. Now we come down to Mark. And since they're all using a 30 AD bench line, we're looking for a number that's 30, 30 less. And Mark's bracketing it, not at 250 or 253, but at 246 and 268. So we'll start there and mark. We'll just leave it like here. And then Revelation is kind of different because it's a very different date start, 88 AD. So we have to like 
sort of play with it. So if we're looking at 283, which is really the start of Diocletian, not Constantine, then we're going to subtract 88, and the number we want in Revelation is 195. Okay, and we don't quite get there. We got 184 and 199. So here is the period for Diocletian. I guess maybe I should start with Diocletian. He's good at lead in into uh, Constantine as any. Because everything Constantine does is really based on Diocletian. He apes everything Diocletian did. Just like uh, Trump apes everything Putin says, so Constantine aped everything Diocletian did. Okay, it's really important to know that because the whole Catholic Church is based on the model that Diocletian set as a pagan. Not based on, Constantine didn't change that model. And the Church just adopted the whole thing lock, stock, and barrel. Okay, and that's what was being condemned here. And how do you know it's a condemnation? We're going to have to go through the actual text and see it. But what you want to do is you want to start again, Matthew 1st. Luke 2nd, Mark 3rd, Revelation 4th. Okay, that's the order in which you want to read this to get your precise fix on what it's saying about that period of history. So where we're going to start when we come back is notice this, how cute this is. Okay. A nation will rise up against nation. Yeah, that's what this is about. It's called the crisis of the 3rd century. That's exactly what happened then. Go Google that. Google on Crisis of the Third Century. It's a famous title in Roman history. It's, for, it's about this period of time. It was basically a civil war of nations against nations. And you'll notice that it's reserved. This is 280 AD. This is before, just before Con, uh, Diocletian comes to power. And they will rise up nation against nation. That's Matthew 24-7. And you should be able to see that in your translation, pretty much translated the way I just said it. Okay? And that's where we're going to pick up at the next increment, because I'm losing my voice.